In your bulletin this morning, you'll find prayers at the lighting of the Advent wreath. So we'll read that together. For the second Sunday in Advent, O Adonai and leader of the house of Israel, who appeared us in a bush to Moses in a flame of fire and gavest him the law on Sinai, come and deliver us with an outstretched arm. Ignition. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that by thy holy word, which is read in this place, and that by thy Holy Spirit, grafting it inwardly in the heart, the hearers thereof may both perceive and know those things they ought to do, and may have power and strength to fulfill the same. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll continue with, with hymn 9, verse 3. did the events of our gospel lesson today in Luke chapter 21 take place? In the gospel, the apostles were touring the new temple that was being built. It was actually the second uh, temple that was being built, being constructed. It's probably in its final phases. You know, they're looking around at the temple going, you know, great engineering feats had to have taken place. I mean, they it's made out of these blocks that weigh tons and, you know, just like the pyramids were built, they had all kinds of clever ways to get things in place. And they were probably looking at that and Jesus foretells what's going to happen to this second temple. He's saying all of this in the time of his earthly ministry, which would have taken place roughly sometime between 30 and 33 AD. He foretells the second destruction of Jerusalem and subsequently the temple, which happens about 50 years later in 70 AD, long after the death and resurrection of Christ, where Roman armies delivered a terrible visitation upon Jerusalem, one that was greater than the previous destruction of the city and the first temple several centuries before. Now, I remember when I was in college, some of my favorite professors would give us the answers to the test at the beginning of the course. Do you ever have that? <clears throat> Every, once in a while, you'll get a professor. They'll give you the answers to the test. Well, today, I'm just going to give you the answers to the, what this whole sermon's about. And I want you to keep, it, keep this in mind as I go through this. In the gospel today, the Lord was talking about the destruction of the temple in, in, in terrific ways. And what he's really talking about is the end of the world. 
what he's really talking about is a demarcation line between the time for repentance and redemption. In fact, when I was writing this, I drew a little graphic up so that I could remind myself of this. The time for repentance would be over, and it's time for redemption. There, I gave you the answer to the test in advance. The Gospels make it that Christ foretold this would come just as certain prophets had foretold the destruction of the city in the previous occasion, which was 587 B.C., by those Babylonians. Today's Gospel passage is one such passage in which our Lord speaks of the solemn events that were coming. The astute will also pick up how his words also speak of the final judgment on the world. It is clear from our Lord's words that these horrifying events for the city were not just an unfortunate result of political or military mistakes or lack of prudence amongst faraway leaders. Rather, they constituted a divine judgment upon the city, just as previous events have represented a divine judgment. We know this because Scripture states it, and Jesus' words are clear. He says that what is coming will be the time of punishment when all the scriptures are fulfilled. In earlier chapters, he says, woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days, for a terrible calamity will come upon the earth and a wrathful judgment upon the people. Now, apart from the specific prophecies of scripture, any interpretations of calamities as divine judgments can be legitimate but they are at most private interpretations. In one of his writings, John Henry Newman, who became a Roman Catholic cardinal, describes the invasion and hammering of the Roman Empire by the barbarian peoples, such as the Huns, as a divine judgment on Rome for persecuting Christians prior to Constantine. So at that time in the world, there was a great shift happening where forces in the Far East were moving west and putting pressures on the peoples there. The Germans would start moving more westward and so forth, the Franks and, and, and everything. And it caused a great movement of peoples all over Europe at that time. And what he's saying is that this was happening because it was God's wrath for persecuting Christians. Rome felt it was, a, a, it, Rome felt it as a direct uh, pressure on them. In fact, they were invaded. Well, that is a legitimate view and it's to be respected because of the eminence of Newman. Nevertheless, it is still just a personal opinion. Certainly, our divine Lord is not saying in today's gospel that all sufferings are punishments for the sins of those who are suffering. Nor does he teach that a person's sufferings are in proportion to his sins. On the contrary, on one occasion, our Lord had cured a woman who had been bent over for a long time. Then he replied to the, the criticisms of the Pharisees by saying that Satan had held the woman bound into that posture. So it was not because of her own sins that she had been suffering this way. On another occasion, he stated that the ones that were killed by a falling tower were not more sinful than others, nor were the ones that Pilate had killed during the sacrifices. Indeed, we gain the impression from Scripture that while certain sufferings that come to a person constitute a judgment on that person's sins, generally speaking, the sufferings that God allows constitute a loving correction. And I know this is hard to understand. But they constitute a loving correction with a view towards amendment and perhaps a trial that tests, proves, and nourishes his or her fidelity. In the case of such a, 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 a good man like Job, the sufferings he undergoes is a test and proof of patient, in, of patient fidelity, which God will reward. The paradigm here of all of this is our Lord himself, Christ's sufferings and death at the hands of sinners, manifested as his obedient love. The upshot was his own exaltation 
and the redemption of the world. With respect to destruction, the destruction of Jerusalem, he specifically implies this in respect to those that are faithful to God and who are caught up in the sufferings. Our Lord says that our people will die of fright and in, in anticipation of what is coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken and they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. He instructs us, when these signs begin to happen, stand erect and raise your heads because your redemption is at hand. Raise your heads because your redemption is at hand. That's, wow, that's brave. That is a point that we can take for our everyday lives. You know, things happen. The stock market crashes, people become suddenly poor, businesses fail, thousands are driven to unemployment as the economy fails, people will suffer through no fault of their own. A bridge crashes and many people are lost. A ship sinks, taking all hands down with it. We remember 9-11, right? World, World Trade Center's Tower 1 and 2 are destroyed by terrorists and 3,000 people died. Many people can suffer. Why does God allow this to happen? We do not know. What is necessary, though, is that crisis is the opportunity to exercise patient fidelity to God in the face of suffering. Raise your head, Jesus said. It is notable how often the lives of saints are marked by violence and very great suffering. In this, in this, their difficult situations parallel, in a generic sense, those of Christ. Their sufferings were their opportunity to manifest their patience and fidelity to God and his will. The meaning of their suffering is obviously that it tests and proves out their love. So, you know... No matter what happens to us in life, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. When crisis comes and perhaps our death is imminent, the time for repentance is over. The time of judgment will arrive. We will all face this. As such, let us resolve to turn every occasion into an opportunity to show our love and our obedience to God, our Heavenly Father. And let us do so in union with Christ by the power and grace of the Holy Spirit. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns as our eternal Father forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
closing hymn is hymn number 489. Hymn number 489. 